the archaeological site that shall not be named. We are, of course, talking about the so-called Joshua Altar at Mount Ebel on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. The archaeological site at Mount Ebel was bound to inflame passions, and it still remains one of the most controversial sites in biblical archaeology. Now, Mount Ebel is in the tribal holdings of Manasseh and is located in the West Bank just north of Mount Gerizim. Adam Zertel began his excavations at Mount Ebel in 1980. But already in 1982, rumors were circulating that Zertel had identified a structure found there as Joshua's altar. Then in 1985, Zertel announced to the world through the popular press magazine, Biblical Archaeology Review, that he found what he thought was an altar at Mount Ebel that dated to the time of Joshua. And that's when the crap hit the fan. What Sertel found caused a firestorm in the academic community. Almost immediately, he was denounced by giants in the field such as Finkelstein, Kempinski, Rainey, and Deaver. Yet, these polemics seem at a prima facie level to be fueled by theoretical demagoguery and perceived slights garnered through Zertel's subversion of the peer review process, rather than a considered evaluation of the data. These scholars were more concerned that Sertel had not gone through the peer-reviewed channels where their voices might have more weight. You see, the problem with Sertel's find is not what he found, but where he found it. If this discovery had occurred in any other location, no one would have cared in the slightest. But this was Mount Ebel. It was a site mentioned in the Bible. We first find it in Deuteronomy 27, verses 4 to 8, quote, So it shall be, when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebel these stones, as I am commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Moreover, you shall build an altar there to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not wield an iron tool on them. You shall build the altar of the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God and you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very distinctly. Then, in Joshua 8, verses 30 to 33, quote, Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebel, just as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no man had wielded an iron tool. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there on the stones a copy of the Law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. And all Israel, with their elders and officers, and their judges, were standing on both sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The stranger, as well as the native, half of them stood in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebel, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded to, at the first to bless the people of Israel. So the announcement that an altar had been found dating to the time of Joshua on Mount Ebel was certain to elicit a negative reaction from a field that had become convinced 
that the Israelites arose from a native Canaanite population and that the Torah was written after the 7th century BC. Now, as we get to Zertel's finds, we have to be aware of certain things that have affected people's perceptions towards the archaeological work. And perhaps more importantly, what wasn't affected by those perceptions. First, let's get out of the way the matter of Zertel's methods as a field archaeologist. The underlying archaeological methods used by Zertel are practically uncontested. Nobody really has said that Zertel's methods were unorthodox or that they were compromised in any particular way. So as far as his excavation goes, everyone sort of agrees that it's a perfectly good excavation. But there were actually several criticisms that were leveled against Zertel's work. To begin with, Zertel was accused of having a religious bias, being a religious Jew. Now, this is the Baconian fallacy, the idea that a researcher must have no preconceived notions when he starts his work. And David Hackard Fisher does talk about the Baconian fallacy at the beginning of his book on historians' fallacies. Now, Zertel has frequently acknowledged that he has biases in this regard and has taken steps to account for them. So, I don't think this criticism holds much water. Zertel was also accused of presumptuously interpreting his own finds as a field archaeologist. However, is it not the field archaeologist's prerogative to be the first person to interpret his own finds? This is a long-standing tradition in archaeological literature and is not considered to be an academic faux pas. So this is sort of griping about nothing at all. Zertel was also criticized for announcing a find that contradicted the scholarly consensus, which had already decided that the Deuteronomistic history had been written during the post-exilic period. And I think Zertel rightly pushed back against the junk critical theories that currently dominate the field. Overall, Zertel's findings were shunned by scholars who wanted to distance themselves from a discovery that would put them at odds with their more secular peers. So, what did Zertel find at Ebel that made it the vault mort of sites? Well, they discovered a four-room house, which is associated with Israelite settlements. Now, in response, the skeptical element argued that Israelites adopted this style of housing from surrounding Canaanites. But that is not all that was found there. They also found faunal remains. A lot of faunal remains. And these are the, the, the sort of the bones of animals. That's what we mean by faunal remains. But the proportion of faunal remains they find at the Mount Ebel site is very, very interesting. 65% of the Fallen remains are sheep and goat bones. 21% come from cattle. And 10% from fallow deer, with the remaining 4% being other, other animals. The, uh, what is so interesting about these fallen remains is we find no pigs, no donkeys, no carnivores, and no gazelles. So what we see here is almost a, this very sharp break between what we find at Canaanite sites versus what we start seeing at Israelite sites. So, if these are Canaanites at Mount Ebel, these are Canaanites that kept kosher as early as the 13th century BC. So that's very, very provocative find right there. But the skeptic continues. Okay, just because these Canaanite sites were keeping kosher does not mean that this was a ritual site. 44% of the fallen remains from the main structure of this site and its courtyards were charred. 
So that means that they were used in burnt offerings. Edelman states, quote, The presence of exotic materials and huge amounts of animal bones, including deer, tend to favor occultic use for the site, end quote. In addition, slabs of plaster were found at this site, per Deuteronomy 27.4. Now, the importance here is that plaster was only used at ritual and, say, official royal sites until the Hellenistic period. Now, the thing with Mount Ebal is it's way, this is not a royal site. I mean, it's not big enough to be a royal site, and it's too distant from anything important. So that sort of limits this down to being a ritual site. So it's clearly that's what's going on here, is that there's what they would term in, in Hebrew as ola or burnt burnt sacrifice that are being made here on the site. But the skeptic's not done. Well, okay, but the dating of Forzutel's altar is all wrong according to biblical chronology. See? Zertel's site is not the biblical date, which is 1400 BCE. No, it's not the fundamentalist date of 1400 BC. Storage pots found at Ebel are clearly Israelite and date to the Late Bronze Age or Early Iron Age I, and most of them are concentrated in Early Iron Age I. So the site dates to around 1200 BC, which is consistent with the late Exodus date. Yeah, well, well, pottery typology is circular reasoning. You're assuming it's Israelite pottery in the typology to try to prove that the site dates to the time of Joshua. Okay. Two scarabs were found at the site. The first is a commemorative scarab of Thutmosis III that was made during Dynasty 19 from stylistic considerations. The second scarab is another Dynasty 19 scarab that has the name of Ramses II on it. This means that the terminus post quem date, so basically the earliest that site could be, is the late 13th century BC. And the remains there indicate that the site was only occupied from circa 1200 to 1140 BC, according to Hawkins, 2008, page 7. Well, well, how do we know that this wasn't just Canaanite ritual? Okay. A stand incense altar similar to an Egyptian one that was used at Sarabit el Khadim was found at the site. Also found at the site is a small 2 cm by 2 cm lead amulet that was only just deciphered this year using scanning technology. And what was revealed on the inside of this amulet was both a Paleo-Hebrew oxhead aleph and an Egyptian lotus motif. So we know the people at this site had some familiarity with both Egyptian rituals and with, say, Semitic language, at least to at least a limited extent. Well, well, the central structure could still be a watchtower instead of an altar. Okay, now, Kempinski has argued that the Ebel site was a watchtower instead of a cultic site. But this is a problematic interpretation. Towers, especially for fortification purposes, are usually connected to a fort, or temples, or at least have a retaining wall. The Ebel Tower would be a tower standing in complete isolation from other supporting structures. This would make a tower of this nature very, very difficult to defend. Furthermore, the site is also isolated from all roads and areas of military importance, which would then sort of broach the question, why would you put a tower in the middle of nowhere? 
it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Furthermore, the, quote, tower lacks both fortifying walls, a door, and stairs that might lead up to a door. So building a tower you can't get into just doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, Zempensky's rationale for this being a watchtower instead of an altar was that the construction of the altar isn't solid. It's essentially a stone wall that has a secondary wall that runs across the middle of it. So he thinks that this is actually two rooms. However, early Israelite altars were hollow in the center. One of the most important examples of this is the altar that was constructed for the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, which was essentially acacia wood on the outside, covered in bronze, and then with a grating across the hollow region to support the burnt offering. So the idea that when the Israelites come into the Holy Land and build their first altars, and they too are hollow on the inside, makes a lot of sense. Furthermore, when Zertel excavated the altar at Mount Ebel, he found two feet of ash there. Now that's a lot of ash. Even for, say, a collapsing structure such as a a tower. So I think it is consistent with what we know of, say, early Israelite ritual structures. Well, well, these might be Israelites, but they are not the same Israelites that wrote the Torah. Okay. We have a site described in the book of Joshua that is in the right place, at the right time, described as it was in its earliest phase, with an altar and a burnt offering ritual, and using plaster to cover stone. The attributes of the site match the attributes in the biblical texts. If the attributes match, then we have a one-to-one correspondence between these Israelites and the biblical Israelites. Moreover, we know from the Merneptah Stila that the Israelites were in the region of Israel at this time, and they were known as Israelites. By doubling down in saying that you've shown that these are Israelites, but that these aren't the ancestors of the later Israelites, what is being committed here is a fallacy of ignorance. That is, one is being shown the evidence, but one changes the scope to where one thinks there is no evidence so that one can assert a claim. That is, you've shown these are Israelites, but these aren't the same Israelites. Having given sufficient evidence that these are Israelites, the burden of proof now rests on the skeptic to show why these aren't the ancestors of the later Israelites. And just to be clear, evidence depends upon facts, not theories. Well, 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 the documentary hypothesis proves that you torture puppies and I hate you. Uh, okay. Regardless, while the site at Mount Ebel still awaits the final archaeological report, enough has been released through the preliminary reports and Ralph Hawkins' dissertation to suggest that the site on Mount Ebel is an important cult site for our understanding of the period of the Israelite conquest. Is this actually the altar? that was built by Joshua in Joshua 8, 30-31? It's impossible to be certain, but the evidence seems to support this view. 
Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you learned something today. And I want to thank you for watching this video. And I'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.